Over the past half century, urbanization, digitization, and migration have transformed the world. In short, it has become globalized. Everywhere, except perhaps here in Cuba. This is a land apart, on the sidelines, frozen in time since the Cold War. A place where history has been slowed down by almost 60 years of revolution and the effects of an embargo imposed by its powerful American neighbor. But today, America is back. Barack Obama paid a visit to Raul Castro. A historic handshake followed. Fidel himself has fallen silent. A page has been turned, the economic blockade is over, Cuba has rejoined the rest of the world, and is now undergoing another, smaller revolution, this time a multifaceted one. Havana will be restored and rehabilitated. It will be reborn like a phoenix. I'm living off the embargo today. It's thanks to that that I have all these cars and my own business. We need to grow up economically, socially and culturally. That's the future. If I had to do it again, I'd still be Cuban. Me too. Having stayed away from the excesses of overconsumption, is Cuba the sanctuary of Caribbean culture? Has its heritage been better preserved, or has it in fact deteriorated? That's life. <laughs> To understand these changes, our trip begins in the historic neighborhood of Old Havana. This is where a different revolution began, that of tourism. The old Cuba of the 1950s has become a saleable asset. Che Guevara, the icon of revolutionary socialism, is all the rage amongst North Americans, with Canadians at the front of the queue. Americans are also showing up in numbers, following in Hemingway's footsteps to the Bodiquita del Medio, where now you have to pay to take a photo. Hey friend, you can't film here. No filming. Three million visitors this year, twice as many as there were 15 years ago. The tourists are a godsend. Here in Cuba, we welcome everyone who comes. We open our arms and our hearts to them. Being Cuban is a real pleasure because we have the blessing and protection of El Comandante. Today, he allows us to be what we want to be. Tourism is indeed a godsend for Cuba, since it has been the island's chief source of revenue since the withdrawal of Soviet aid in 1990. And Havana's colonial neighborhood has had a makeover. The project began in the early 1980s, creating a unique example of urban regeneration. As you know, the old square is a special case. These are the last priorities of the renovation program. Patricia Rodriguez Aloma runs the city heritage office. She is supervising the renovation program.
This is what the old square looked like at the end of the 1970s. And this is what it has become. The old square is the perfect illustration of the philosophy the historian's office is trying to introduce in the old center. It's a concept of global development so that all city departments can be together in the same place. For example, where that flag is, that's the primary school that looks over the square. And the first thing we did here was to take back the public space, the space for social activity. For us, that's fundamental. And as such, as you go around the square, you can see that there are museums, stores, cultural institutions, and offices, too. And on the upper floors, there's also social housing. This is a project that has an extremely important social function. We can go and look at that building. It's an extraordinary little palace from the 18th century. Hello. It was restored and transformed into a small hotel. It's a very typical construction of the old town. I knew this building when it was practically destroyed. It was a little car repair workshop. The patio was totally closed over. There was a steel joist that went right across the whole building that was used to transport the motors for cars and trucks to repair them here. The place was totally spoiled. And you can see today that it's become a little piece of paradise. This is an area we call the border zone. And by that I mean a transitional zone, because the restoration has an extension plan that is gradually going to spread out. You can clearly see that this neighborhood isn't yet completely renovated. We're doing what we can. You can see the arcades, the glass roofs, the ironwork. All these original structures and this wooden ceiling in the entrance are original and allow us to date this building. This one won't be destroyed. It will be renovated because we can readily save it. We've already carried out emergency repairs so that the building doesn't collapse. We've consolidated the structure. It's essential that life goes on in the old town. Because if the old town is no longer inhabited, it will lose its reason for being. It will lose its soul. The inhabitants guarantee its culture, way of life and customs. And the cultural exchanges between those who live here and the tourists who come must be preserved. That's the challenge. Vintage is in fashion, but the irony of the story is that the American car has become the emblem of the rebirth of Havana.
These Yank tanks have become cult objects. They are part of Cuba's heritage, and it's illegal to export them. In Cuba, motor mechanics is a passion as much as it is a necessity. This one has a problem with the steering. Santiago is one of those magicians who, for decades, has been keeping these classic cars on the roads. The cars here need to be maintained. We can't let them fall apart. Some parts have been lost, so we need to replace them with others. You find any old motor, and if it works, you go with it. These cars that you see make a lot of smoke. They're almendrons, collective taxes. They have gearboxes from all kinds of trucks and even tractor engines, so they shake. They're almendrons, and that's what you see in Havana. Collective taxes, really beat up. Before, the whole garage was full of Soviet motors, and now they're all American. The cars have changed, because everyone who comes here wants to find original motors. That's totally new in the past couple of years. Now it's crazy. It's like we're going back in time. Everyone is looking for original motors. Look at these pistons, they're American. Before, we couldn't get hold of them. Look, it fits perfectly. I'm still going to keep the Soviet motors for the future, in case we have to put them back in. Here, you never know what's going to happen. In any case, day after day, the only thing that runs in Cuba is the Almendrons. The old American cars last. They just keep on going. Hundreds of thousands of kilometers for these cars that survived the embargo, the withdrawal of Soviet assistance, and the so-called special period which followed in the early 1990s. The Almendrons that survived the tough times are still here. And for a few pesos, that's how the Cubans get around. <laughs> Roger is a taxi driver. His car embodies the country's history and its exceptional capacity for resistance. This one has a Mercedes motor, but it's an American Dodge. I don't think there's a single bit of original bodywork remaining. These cars need to be totally renovated so that they don't fall to pieces. They're good for working. They have a solid chassis that can stand up to the bumps and potholes. Modern cars don't have chassis like these. They're more fragile. Prior to 1989, there was decent public transport in Cuba. But when that collapsed, people got out their old Almondrons. That's what launched the Almondrons, not tourism. We have very basic needs. There is very little public transport. There's one, but you don't know when the next one will come. Shall I drop you here? Here. Yes, that's perfect. Thanks. Have a nice day. <laughs> Does the country operate like an almendron? No. It's worse. It's worse. The almendrons have an owner that looks after them and improves them and uses them as a business. Granted, we have economic problems, but it's not just that. I think you also need to show an interest. You need to be motivated. Do you know what I mean? In Cuba, the metaphor is an art one uses to get around censorship. 
In any case, the revolution continues. According to the walls of Havana, there's no retirement for these old automobiles. This is the center of Havana, with the old city on the right. This is the tourist area. After the stoplight, it's half tourists, half Cubans. These are cars for tourists. Most of them are convertibles. Do you like the pink ones or the yellow ones? Beautiful, isn't she? She's for tourists. That's why she's in such great shape. They're almost always convertibles. Look, they cut the top off because this model wasn't a convertible. <laughs> it's like a museum. Look how lovely they are. Look at that. How much would that one cost? 20,000? Look, 20,000 CUC. All this looks new. They put plates on, then stainless steel on top, and you think it's new. But it isn't. This one, yes, she's worth 20,000. That's original. They're lovely, solid, shiny objects. You can't deny it, it's impressive. But it's not the cars that deserve the praise. It's us, because no cars last 50 or 60 years. We Cubans struggle to keep these cars beautiful and to maintain them, to stop them becoming wrecks, because that's all we have. The story of these cars is the story of us, we Cubans who fight for survival and do everything that's possible, and even sometimes the impossible. I think all the world knows that. But you have to admit, they're beautiful. They are real gems, dazzling, restored to be as good as new. These taxis have become the number one tourist attraction and are good business for the owner. Trips are paid for in dollars or CUC, the second Cuban currency, invented to bring in cash with the peso index linked to the dollar. Julio Manuel had a nose for a smart move. He set up a customized taxi agency for foreign customers, a success story with a flavor of the American dream. Here, we redo all the interiors, and we make them ourselves our own way. And all that is done here with technology that is more than 50 years old. It's an old singer machine from the 1940s. We're artists. We don't repair cars, we bring them back to life. Here, we restore everything. It takes seven or eight months. The dashboard is almost original. The steering wheel, too. The gauges and the radio are original. But the former owner changed lots of things. So we're going to replace them with new parts that I'm importing directly from the USA. This whole part, rub it all down well. The private sector has opened up in Cuba. 
So I got into business in Cuba. I started out with a 55 Chevrolet that I inherited from my family. It was beautiful and it brought me customers. Business took off and today I've got lots of old cars I've restored. All these cars are like my children and I won't sell them when I finish them. This one coming now is the latest baby that I've just finished. Chevrolet Impala from 1960. The last year when American cars came into Cuba. It's a pleasure to drive. It's perfect. I love it. It's the tops. Tomorrow it'll start work as a taxi. I only got to enjoy it for a couple of weeks. Tomorrow it'll get its new driver and we'll move on to another project. This is Revolution Square. This is where the big Cuban government ministries are. You can see all the tourists who come here by car. It's a symbol of Cubania and we have to maintain this tradition. I think that the reason these cars are still around isn't thanks to the revolution. The revolution is one of the reasons, but the main reason is the American embargo on Cuba for more than 50 years. We weren't allowed to bring in cars. I'm living off that embargo now. Thanks to the embargo, I have these cars that are still going and I built up a business. Without them, I'd have had another business, who knows? But that's how it is. And so I have my cars. I think that we Cubans now have the chance to change the way we think. Roger is continually asking the question, pesos or dollars? Almendron or tourist taxi? It's not easy to enter the market economy. I need to make a lot of modifications, make her prettier, polish her up, make her shine, cut off the roof and maybe even change the engine. Because for tourists, you don't use diesel engines. The original petrol engines are better. You'd have to replace that, wouldn't you? No, that's nothing. We can put back some iron, plate it with steel and then repaint it. But I like her like that. I'm very fond of her. A little paint here and that's all. She's not ugly, is she? Is she ugly or just in bad condition? This city, founded 500 years ago, is one that Patricia would like to make eternal. I love my city. I was born here, and for me it's the most beautiful city in the world, no question. We managed to ensure our city is being preserved, and today we're going to renovate it and it will be reborn from the ashes, like the Phoenix, with all these wonderful buildings that will be restored. To do this, Patricia is counting on the School of Artisans, directed by Juan Carlos Botello. Botello, ah. Botello, darling, how are you? We're molding the support for the lantern of the capital. This part here will go in the center of the lantern. And how many pieces do you need to go around? 30. 30? Come and look at these moldings for the Paraguay Salon. These are the flower motifs for the main portico. Some of them were damaged. The ones at the top of the steps? On the capital, yes. And this piece in stone will replace it. 
The workshop school is a crucial establishment. Without this school, it would be impossible to do the restoration, both in the old town and elsewhere in Havana. This knowledge had virtually disappeared. There were only a few craftsmen we managed to find in the 1990s, so we started then to train the trainers. I always say this is not a place, it's not a group of people. The workshop school is a concept that goes beyond the framework of the school, because we are training students, and that creates a chain. By training young people in these old crafts, all this knowledge is given back to the people. That knowledge is transmitted into the different neighborhoods and into building companies, and that's what the school does. The Cuban capital needed a whole army of craftspeople to restore its beauty of the 1940s and 1950s. Havana was then one of the marvels of the Caribbean. Today, it is falling into disrepair. Even the Malecon, this emblematic seafront boulevard, is under threat. These bourgeois buildings from the early 19th century are collapsing. This is Professor Andres, and here is Mr. Virado, who is one of the school's founders. In fact, the youngest of the school's founders. And this is Mr. Pedro, an engineer whose task it is to determine the state of the structure. The Malecon is being attacked by corrosion. For the first time, the school workshop has come out of the old town to try and save this architectural heritage. All these buildings have greatly deteriorated due to a lack of maintenance and having been abandoned for so many years. And it's also due to the proximity of the sea. Seventy to eighty percent of the constructions are badly damaged. A lack of money and materials is slowing progress and aggravating the problem. It could all fall down any time. At the top, I saw that the natural white stone is not so badly damaged. It's even compatible with the iron. So we'll see which materials are most resistant to the salt. I think the stone that's in the sea is best adapted. Whatever happens in future, it will be better. With the increasing number of tourists and people who can travel to take part in the renovation, all those factors can only improve the situation and help save the city. Saving the city is the challenge. Havana and its heritage is in critical state. Another highly symbolic monument is the capital. It is also enjoying a facelift. It represents a huge project and a mission of the utmost importance because, after years of neglect, the capital will soon be home to the Cuban parliament. This salon is magnificent. Omaro, compared to other salons, the moldings here are in pretty good condition, right? This molding and everything you see here has been restored by the workshop school. This salon is now almost finished, and it'll be a meeting room for the National Assembly of the People. 
This is one of the halls we restored and are working on to make the connection with the other gallery, which is the Salon of the Senate, I think. I always get mixed up between the assembly there and the Senate there. Before, this used to be the Natural History Museum. And when I was a child, I'd come visit the capital. But I never imagined that one day I'd be involved in restoring it. I remember once there was a big exhibition here about the Soviet Union. We're proud to work here because it's a building that has great value, not just for us architects, but for the country as a whole. There are many buildings close by the capital that are extremely valuable in heritage terms. What is interesting is the great variety you find in the architecture. There are classically inspired facades, but also Art Deco and Art Nouveau inspired buildings. The triumph of the revolution offered a wonderful opportunity to Havana, apart from any political considerations. It was of historical importance because there was a plan to demolish part of the old town. So that means if the revolution had succeeded two years later than it did, a large part of the city wouldn't be how it is today. But there's a real threat, right? Yes, of course, but I'm staying optimistic because anything is still possible. You say that 70 to 80 percent could end up collapsing. For example, the facades that are from the 17th or 19th century. But they're still standing. We just need to consolidate them. That's why I think the face of Havana won't change and will stay the same for a long time to come. Convalescing after so many years of impoverishment, yet embellished by a patina of time and the spectacle in its streets, Havana possesses an irresistible charm, the beauty of a heroic city. For 10 million Cubans, romance and Cubania were ways to escape deprivation and boredom. And the Cuban people have maintained a certain self-deprecating manner. Getting up in the morning with no money, looking for it all day, and going to bed without a cent. That's Cubania. But you're still happy. Oh, you need 20 bucks to party. Today, a new wind is blowing through Havana. In the old town, there's something new happening. And some are already calling it the Scissor Revolution. In this part of the old town that's known for its hairdressing salons, Gilberto has transformed his into a tourist destination and the headquarters of a philosophy, the philosophy of hair. And it's no laughing matter. This is a place where art, history, and hairdressing cohabit. I started with a chair, some scissors, and hair like this, and it turned into this place.
The most important thing is that it must be a living place. I think that's important. You don't cultivate Cubania, but rather a way of being Cuban. And in this critical historical period we're living through, the most important legacy is the people. Cubans have a different social structure. In our culture, we are close to one another. We help each other a lot. And you need to understand the importance of this culture and these human values we have to rethink the future. It's true that in Cuba, there are things that need to change or be improved. But we can't lose everything. It's not all about money. There are material things and there are spiritual things. Theory and practice are just one step apart for Gilberto. A child of the revolution, this businessman shares his time between his private salon and the hairdressing school at the end of the street, where, like all the teachers, he works as a volunteer. This is our school. The young apprentices in this school come from the poorer neighborhoods. These ones are hard of hearing. Cut it a little shorter. It's important. Wash and then dry. Our aim is to teach the hairdressing trade as well as social values and to end up providing them with a livelihood. The private sector is expanding in Cuban society and as someone from the private sector, I think that everyone should give something back to society whether it's money, work, knowledge, or time. It's important to create something that can be passed on. It's a philosophy that should be handed down and others should do the same. It's important to grow economically, socially, and culturally, all at the same time. Now we're going to dance at the old people's home. It's a public health project that we help with, developing a cultural project for retired people. We dance in the style we call son. The idea is that the young people and the old people share a cultural moment involving Cuban music. The older people have to teach the younger ones. And it's an activity that the people in this neighborhood really appreciate. And anyone who wants to can join in. Are you OK? <laughs> yes, thanks be to God. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Did you like what I cooked for you last week? Yes, it was wonderful. I love this guy. We're going to do the disco every Wednesday, but we're also going to organize a domino tournament with the oldies against the kids from the school. It's a philosophy, the philosophy of hair. I think it's important. Starting from hairdressing, you can see that society can be changed. And I'm proud of that. It's the future.
I've always danced. I love dancing and I still dance a lot. It's the best party in Havana, the Son Disco. I love coming here with the older people who teach us to dance. It's great fun. OK, see you next Wednesday. Social and political heritage is in the Cubans' DNA. A few blocks over is the Calle Hunde Hamel, a pedestrian street full of surrealistic artwork. It's no longer son music you can hear, but rumba. Rumba is above all spiritual music. That of Santeria, a combination of Catholicism and animistic beliefs from Africa. Since the crisis in the 1990s, Santeria has never been so popular. In Cuba, there is the god that is Fidel, and now there is also Ochun, Yamaya, and all the other Santeria gods and saints. A little revolution that has turned the Callejón de Jamel into the place for rumba and the Afro-Cuban tradition, which is wonderful for Salvador, the creator of all these works. I think that in Cuba, there's a very interesting thing happening which is that there's a lot of culture with African origins that has been imported to America and the Caribbean and to Cuba, where they have survived, where they are expressed and where they flourish. I never thought when I started this job about doing something for tourists. And I'd never have imagined that a Calle Honda Hamel would become so important, that it would become a temple to black culture. I'm happy because I love what I do and because I feel black inside, because I love my land and I'm not a hypocrite in terms of history and I defend Afro-Cuban values and culture. That's life. <laughs> Hello and welcome. I'd like you to give a warm welcome to our rumba group. Rumba Morena. In this temple to Afro-Cuban culture and rumba, every weekend, the dancers introduce visitors to these African rhythms.
In Santeria ceremonies, the language spoken is known in Cuba as Yoruba. It's not really the Yoruba language that is spoken in Nigeria. It's a liturgical language, a dead language, a language that is repeated and handed down from generation to generation by oral tradition. And we preserve that language, but we don't use it. It's not like we created a language like Creole in Haiti. We still speak Spanish, but we enrich it with a few words of African origin. Among the dancers is Kukito, a Santero who is still learning. He wears white, indicating that he is still in the initiation phase. The year you spend in white is to purify you and make sure you get it all right. I believe in it because I've seen it since I was a kid. And because I've always been at the ceremonies when the drums and mediums predicted things that actually happened. Santeria is everywhere, in the neighborhoods, in the countryside. I can tell you that Santeria is the best thing in the world. You have to feel it, and you have to have it in your heart. Santeria means Cubania. It's 100% Cuban. The following day, Coquito is at home with his friends from the troupe for a party at which he is the guest of honor. He is going to become a fully-fledged Santero and will no longer have to wear white. The drums are there to establish the connection between the invisible world and the world of the living. These magic-filled rituals are far from the reality of socialism. Fidel Castro is said to have turned a blind eye on these practices. Some even say El Lider Maximo was cured as a child by a Santero healer. The Santeros loved Fidel. He helped us when we set up the Yoruba Association. We are true Cubans, and we don't practice witchcraft, as some say, but Santeria. There's no harm in it. To respect the law of the drums, and before trying to get into contact with the dead, Kukito and Tai Rumi pray at this strange altar. Today, it's the anniversary of the first year of Ayavo, and his saint is Chango. And that's why we've created the throne of Chango with all the saints the Yavo chose. Chango is the guardian angel, the guide. Ochun is his mother, the boss of Cuba, the queen of honey, sweetness, and gold. Obatala is intelligence, the master of our minds. And Ogun is the one that helps you when you're in hospital. They are all important in one way or another. I love this religion. I was initiated two years ago, and I'm a disciple of Chango and Ochun. And if you want to be initiated into the Yoruba religion, first you need to be baptized as a Catholic. You need to believe in God above all.
Through the voice of the drums, the saints call the santeros to be in communion together. And to do this, one needs to enter a state of trance, the ultimate submission of the self. When you're initiated and you are presented before the drums, the saint who is in the drum recognizes your face thanks to your guardian angel, a medium, or your protector. And after a moment, because of the songs, you enter into a trance and into a relationship with the gods, the orishas. For me, it's very tough because you no longer feel your feet, you have no more air. It's really very powerful. After that, the camera is no longer really welcome. The trance is a private affair. On the road, we bumped into another group of young people who were preparing to do the same thing. It's not the only drumming ceremony happening in Havana. Every day there are 10, 30 or 40 drum ceremonies across Havana. Before, because of revolutionary ideals, people hit themselves. But in fact, Santeria has always been practiced here, even during colonial times. When we were forced to go to the Catholic Church with the Virgin of the King or Santa Barbara. There's always been Santeria. It's part of the Cuban soul. Afro Cuban culture, the architectural heritage, the legacy of the revolution, the desire to reintegrate into the world. Cuba is all that at the same time, at the crossroads of a history that is still being written.